you I'd like to share with you about my journey and how I came to be so passionate about really teaching to the human core. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So just the other day, like two days ago, I was uh, sitting with my students in my class and um, we were sitting in the, on the floor and at the end, you know, the bell rings and then one of my students turns to me and she's like, Mr. Abib, I'm so glad that you're teaching this course because it's really helping me in my personal growth path. <laughs> so in my mind, I'm like, first of all, like, what student has a personal growth path? That's amazing. <laughs> That's number one. Um, <laughs> But then just like, I felt so grateful, you know, to be able to teach a course, you know, that makes such, provides such difference in people's lives, you know. But I want to tell you that this was not always this way for me, okay, at all. So like, by my third year of teaching, I essentially almost burned out, I almost quit, because I felt stressed, I felt, um, you know, people, just the amount of work I had to do was crazy. Um, uh, I teach in Palo Alto, so I had some crazy parent situations, you know what I mean? Um, and and it, it was just like, I, I, you know, kids like studying just for grades as opposed to for learning. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah. and so, yeah. And so I, I almost decided that that's it. But um, then, about seven years ago, I still remember the day, and I think some of you might have heard the story, I uh, got to school and our principal set us all down in a room and told us that one of our students committed suicide. And I really quickly realized that that student was my student. Now, the next morning I was emailed by his mother and I was asked to speak in his funeral. So I, um, that Saturday I went to the funeral obviously and I sat in the first row and I um, saw the mother speak about her child. And then I saw the dad speak about his child. And, uh, and so as you can imagine, this was like the hardest thing I've ever had to do, like personally and professionally. And then it was my turn to go up and speak. So as I'm literally getting off my chair to go up and speak, I feel this searing pain right around the area of my heart. And I remember feeling it because I was so angry with myself that I didn't see this kid's pain. Like, this kid was in my class for four and a half months. Do you know what I mean? Like, how could I miss that? But I did. I missed it because I was disconnected from him. I was disconnected from myself and from him. And I don't know if this ever happened to you, but at the end of my speech, I had this, like, voice come through me uh, that basically told, said, like, look, if I'm going to continue to be a teacher, there is nothing, and I mean nothing, that was going to stop me from putting my students' well-being first. Absolutely nothing. Above grades and above content, too. But if I was going to put my students' well-being first, I was going to teach them how to become healthier and happier, etc. Um, you know how students can smell bullshit from a mile away? <laughs> Well, then uh, I had to start walking the walk, you know what I mean? And uh, so I started changing my life because uh, I realized that I wasn't happy. And I started implementing mindfulness practices into my life, started to um, implement some of the things I learned from personal empowerment and positive psychology, looked into my own gremlins, you know, my inner critic, and did the work I needed to do in order to be able to become happier and more engaged and more alive. And my life truly transformed. And then I had an epiphany. I was like, okay, so if I, have, if I know of these skills that I was taught in college and later on, and it's changed my life, why are we not giving these skills to kids? Like, why, why are we not teaching this to them? And so I created positive psychology at Gun. And I was hoping 25 students will sign up. 107 signed up right away. And year after year, we've had hundreds and hundreds of kids take the course, and we can see behavioral change in these kids. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So then I said, well, why not begin training other teachers in some of the things that I do, because they don't take very long, you know? Uh, mindfulness practices, improv games, things like that don't take long. So we've had workshops, and teachers took them, loved them, started implementing in the class, and we saw amazing changes. So then I was like, well, let's just create a company, you know, like, let's go big and create EQ, we'll create EQ schools, and that essentially brings us to today. This is our full conference. 
and we're all in here together. And when when so many of us are here together, that's when magic happens. So you're gonna in a moment you're gonna move right because we're gonna do it with our hips, okay? And uh, here's the thing. It's a little squishy because there's a lot of people here. So if the person next to you is not moving, just run into them. <laughs> just like this. Yeah. And then the other thing I want to say is, um, do you know how um, sometimes people, especially when they hit turn and all that, people feel a little scared of, of being judged, you know, for the way, and I get it. I totally understand. That's why, I mean, I'm up here, trust me. I'm going to be vulnerable, right? Um, so I want to just say one quick thing. And I say it in the most loving possible way. You're not that important. People are not gonna be like at 2 a.m. tonight, people are gonna be like, I cannot believe she tracks the move that way. You know what I mean? All right, so, all right, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're going to do our, we're gonna do our thing, our signature with our hip. Okay? And then we're gonna, okay, let's just do that, right? You guys ready? All right, here we go. One, two, three, here we go. matters more than anything. I believe connection should come over content. And if connection is really there, then amazing, amazing things can happen in the classroom. And so it's worth spending just a little bit of time with these games, with these mindfulness exercises, in order to get your kids to learn more deeply. I can tell you for a fact that as soon as I started doing that in my class, and I've seen other teachers do it in their class, not only are kids happier, but the academic achievement improves and learning deepens. Both things happen. So I just want to share with you a story about how connection over content has improved the, the achievement and the ability of one of my students. I, in my class, I do something called powerful introductions. And it's uh, basically Every kid has three minutes to share with the rest of the class who he is or who she is through a story in which they share about a struggle that they are facing and maybe a character strength that they have or something they're proud of. But they have to share about something they're also struggling with okay? because there's amazing, amazing things happen when people open up and are vulnerable with one another and actually share about what's truly going on. So I actually take the time to do this with my kids, okay? And um, here is a testimony of one of my students, okay? After doing this exercise, I read their journals and I ask permission to share this journal with you. And this is what he wrote. This is Momo, okay? His name is Mohammed, but he went by Momo, okay? Every, every day I sit down in class and I look around and I see people are so very human. I see people acting more friendly and tender than I ever expected. I see them put their pride outside and trust really what's up. I see people trusting one another. For the first time I've shared with a group about my fear of being less than a good person and I felt so safe. Now, it's a very nice quote. And I read it and I was like, yes. <laughs> but, um, what you need to know about Momo is that Momo was in what's called our DNF list. Like we had gone with this thing called the DNF list, and the kids are getting a lot of these and Fs. And um, Momo, after experiencing this in my class, I mean, he delved into the academic stuff like crazy. You know, like 
she learned about you know, the broad and built theory of positive emotions of Robert Fredrickson. He wrote a paper about that. He, he, in, dis in discussions in class, he came up with amazing uh, arguments. You know? He actively listened to other kids. He had incredible presentations to give to the class. The, the kid basically lit up. And he did, not only did he do incredibly well in my class, he actually used the class to improve his life. And to me, that's like the, the number one, you know? It's the ultimate. So, I urge you to recognize the importance of connection and taking the time to establish this connection. And what I'd love to do, if it's okay with you, is, um, is I want to actually take a moment for you guys to go there, if you're willing to, with the person next to you, just to see what it feels like, okay? Because sometimes it feels really, really good to just be listened to. This evening we're looking at learning, and I want to start off by actually have you guys remember what was your favorite class in school, you know, from preschool to college? What was it? And as you, as you remember it, I want you to think about why did you love this class so much? Did you love it because of the subject, or did you love it because of the teacher who taught it? Right. And what do you remember the most about the class? Do you remember a concept you learned, or do you remember your relationship with your teacher, or perhaps with your friends, right, your peers in the class? You see, relationships come first. They come first in our memory, and they also come first when we want to ensure that deep learning takes place in our classroom. And the reason for that is because we are neurobiologically hardwired to need to belong and to feel connected to others. It's why we're here. It's what we need. It's like an essential part of who we are. And the second reason is that our brains are fundamentally relational. It's a social organ. Our brains are actually directly changed by interactions with other brains. Now, the optimal state for learning for the brain is relaxed alertness. And if our students in our classrooms feel like they don't belong, they can be stressed, and worst case scenario, they can feel really threatened because belonging is such an important part to the, at our core. Now, it might, look, might not look that way you know, from the outside, but from the inside, they could feel stressed, right? And if they do, in that case, they are in fight or flight mode. Their amygdala, in their limbic system basically hijacks their prefrontal cortex. Now, there's many reasons why they might feel that way. Like at Gun High School, for example, we have plenty of students who think that everybody else in the classroom is smarter than they are. So they feel like they don't belong, right? They, they're, they're worried and they're stressed. There are students who might think that others don't like them for one reason or another. Like every single middle schooler to ever live has experienced that, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Now, these, so in other words, teachers, we didn't necessarily do anything to cause this, but our students are still experiencing that. And our job is still to get them back to relaxed alertness, because we're not just disseminators of information. Our job is to spark curiosity. It's to get students to process information, to uh, internalize it, and to use it. And if they're not in a space to do it, our job is to get them to that space. Now, I believe we get them to that space through supportive, safe, and deeper, more meaningful relationships with them and amongst them. And I'm going to get into like how you know, to achieve that in a powerful way in a minute. But what about all the students who do do really well? Right? Not all of the students feel like they don't belong. Some of them are happy, and they feel like everything's fine. Um, why should we care so much right, about establishing relationships with them, teaching them relationship skills. And the reason for that is because research has shown that the deepest level of learning happens in relationships. Take a look at Bloom's taxonomy. If you look at the top three components, analyze, evaluate, and create, the top three components require the highest cognitive load. And they're also the components that ensure the students actually fundamentally learn something. Like if you want your students to really learn something, have them do these things. Now, it turns out that these three components are most efficiently 
and productively done in community, in relationships with others, in communication with others. And so if the deepest level of learning happens in classrooms in which relationships are celebrated, right, in which um, you have teachers explicitly teach relationship skills and build relationships with, with their students, how do we do it, right? And it might, it might make common sense to you, right? It might be like, well, yeah, duh, that, that makes sense, you know. Um, but the common sense is not very common. <laughs> That's the problem. And the other thing is that it's not also not trivial. Like, I believe it's not a simple thing to get every single student in your class to feel safe and supported and in, in good relationship with you and other students. I believe we do that by cultivating two things, mindfulness and vulnerability. Mindfulness is the ability to tend to our attention. Picture this for a sec. It's 2 p.m. You've taught four classes. It's hot. Your fifth class comes in. Two kids sit down, and they can't stop talking to one another. And you, you've asked them, hey, can you just be quiet for a second? Let's just start the project, start the lesson, and they keep talking. And you go back and you ask them again and they keep talking. By the third time, you're about to snap. You with me? <laughs> Mindfulness, right, is what allows you to know you're about to lose it on the kids before you lose it on the kids, <laughs> right? So that you can deal with the situation productively. It's what gives you space between stimulus and response, right? It what allows you to self-regulate, but it also is what allows you to be really present with your students right there with them not worrying about a fight that happened in your past class or a future parent-teacher conference. You're with there, with your students. And it has done wonders for me as a person, but also as a teacher. And I wanted to, to try it with my kids, because I was like, okay, if this gives, you know, if I get the benefits I got from it, why not try it with the students and see what happens, you know? But, you know, a mind, mindfulness practice entails, you know, like meditation, attention training exercises. And my initial reaction was like, my students are going to think that I'm a tree-hugging hippie teacher, <laughs> and they're going to think it's lame. I was worried their parents will sue me because they think I'm initiating them into a cult. You know what I mean? Like, and I was really worried, actually, also about my instructional minute. True story. I mean, I was teaching AP Econ at the time. But my intuition was, told me, go for it. Do it. And This is actually a picture of a few of my students doing it. Um, and, I, and what we do is, for three to five minutes in the beginning of class, we meditate. And here's what actually happened. Students loved it. Mm. And they loved it because it was the only time during their extremely hectic day, and we ask students to follow really intense schedules, you guys. Okay, it was the only time during their day where they felt at peace. They felt like they could tune into their body. They could connect to their breath. And it was a reprieve for them. And they asked me to do it every day. Now, because of that, I actually gained instructional minutes. With less minutes, I was able to cover way more material. Because my students were there. They were fully present. They didn't think about lunch or about what the next thing's going to be. They were with me. And I know this, and this kind of blew me away, but on average, their test scores increased pretty significantly after we started doing that. What blew me away even more, though, was that the relationships in the classroom strengthened. And here's why. When, when there was conflict, when two students argued about something or you know, a snarky comment, my students were, not all of them, okay? But for the most part, my students were a lot better at self-regulating. Like, b instead of snapping and saying something mean, they were able to actually stop and communicate more effectively. And what I really didn't expect was that my students will become more empathic. They b actually started teaching each other more. They noticed when somebody didn't understand a concept or um, needed some help. And so what you started to see is that students were teaching concepts to other students. And you know that when you learn something for the first time and then you teach it to somebody else, you learn it at a much deeper level. So what I found was that these mindfulness skills were building relationship skills that deepened learning. And it only took like three to five minutes in the beginning of class. To me, you know, if you're a teacher 
give it a shot. Like, there's no cost, and the benefits are immense. Give it a shot. And also, the next component is be vulnerable with your students. And what I mean by that, you know, you know I don't mean like share everything with your students, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, you know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, right? But show them that you are human. Show them, name your emotions, name your feelings. Tell them a personal story about your life. Show them you're a person, not just a teacher. Because when you do, students now have the permission to not be perfect themselves. And they learn that they can be vulnerable themselves in the class. There are many reasons why vulnerability in the class leads to deeper learning. Let me just name a few. Number one, students become more resilient when they're more vulnerable because they actually seek social support. They ask for help. They're not afraid of asking for help. And we know that the most resilient people are ones that seek social support. They also uh, ask more questions. They're not worried about their self-image as much, right? So they will ask for questions to a teacher. They also take more risks. Sometimes they make mistakes, but here's the thing. They learn from their mistakes. To learn from your mistake, and this is important, you need to own your mistake. You need to say, I made a mistake. That's a vulnerable act, right? And they become more creative and more collaborative. They actually, and I've noticed this, they are willing to share their ideas more with others, which is also a vulnerable act. And finally, they build much more authentic and real relationships with others, which again, deepen learnings as we saw. So vulnerability should be celebrated. And the way I do it in my class is I, use some, I basically do an activity called powerful introductions. The way it works is that in the beginning of the semester, every kid has three minutes to share a story about themselves that introduces them to, the, to their peers in a powerful way. Maybe they share about their a character strength of theirs or something that they've had to overcome, you know, that they're proud of or overcoming. And I model it, you know, I do it in the beginning as well. Now when I, so all in all, the activity takes about 90 minutes, okay? And when I tell that to teachers, the first reaction I get is, whoa, 90 minutes, like I don't have 90 minutes, like there's tests at the end of the year, you know, there's like a lot of material, like I don't, I don't got 90 minutes. Now, you know, if that's, I just want you to think about the following. We don't teach disciplines, we teach people. And if 90 minutes feels like a long time to you, I want you to consider this result. This is a quote from one of my, of journal of one of my students. I have a journal for my class, and, and I read their journals. And uh, <laughs> with, with their permission, with their permission, <laughs> whatever they don't want me to read, they, they uh, you know, fold. But I love this quote. He says, every day I sit down in class and I look around and I see people are so very human. I see people acting more friendly and tender than I ever expected. I see them put their pride outside and show us really what's up. I see people trusting one another. For the first time, I've shared with a group about my fear of being a less than good person and I felt so safe. Mm -hmm. This is a beautiful quote. The thing is, though, that I didn't tell you about the student is that he used to be on our DNF list at Gunn, and he was marginalized. He was deathly afraid of looking stupid in front of others in the classroom. When he noticed that other kids are vulnerable, he started to, be, to feel safe and start to, started to engage. He asked really amazing questions. He argued points. He wrote papers. He, he, um, Mindfully and actively listened to his peers. He presented really innovative presentations. I mean, he was intellectually on fire. He aced the class like this because he felt safe, because he felt that he belonged, because he felt loved. And I want to end today by just sharing with you really quick do's and don'ts towards achieving these types of relationships in the classroom. Let's start with the don'ts. Don't compare your students' work to one another. Now, I want to be clear. I've done most of these things, <laughs> okay? Many teachers do these things. They're not bad teachers. It's just that we need to remind ourselves these things. Don't rank your students ever. Don't let your students just pair up or pick, up, pick who they're going to have on their teams. Invariably, there's going to be a kid left alone, and that's a scar for this kid. Don't ever use sarcasm. Don't show contempt. Don't praise their intelligence or final outcome, praise their effort. Don't dismiss what they have to say. Don't underestimate the power of happiness and positive emotions. 
Don't assume anything about the ability of your students. And I love this saying, assume makes an ass of you and me. Okay. Here are the do's. Greet your students at the door every day. Make repair attempts if you hurt a student. Model that it's OK to apologize. Emotion coach. Help them name what they're feeling. Reward your students for asking more questions, not giving you more answers. Watch your tone. Remember the power dynamic in the classroom. You are very powerful as a, as a teacher. Compliment your students on effort if they deserve it. Let yourself be known. Let yourself be seen. And finally, have a bias towards action. Model vulnerability. Model mindfulness. Greet your students at the door. Do it. Don't just say you're going to do it. Do it. And here's the reason. I actually want to illustrate this to you with a little activity. Take your hands. If you could do this with me. Take your hands. Make it into an L shape. And then make, turn them into like the most perfect circle that you can possibly make. It's kind of hard to do. And then follow my instructions really carefully. I want you to slowly put this circle right on your cheek. Cheek. <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> right. People follow what you do, not what you say. <laughs> so it's with this spirit that I hope that all of us will go back to our classrooms with a bias towards creating and cultivating deep, supportive, safe, and connecting relationships with our students. Thank you.